the hell are you? Yeah, who, who the hell are you? And <laughs> uh -huh. Well, I'm John McGrosso. I'm the first violinist of the Ariana String Quartet. We're a professional string quartet. We travel around the world um, playing and teaching, and it's really fun. And how long have you had an affiliation with uh, Madeline Island Music Camp? And, and uh, uh -huh. uh, why did you come here? Well, I think we started coming here in 2000 or so. And it's been a wonderful place for us to come to work with um, students who are really focused on chamber music, uh, which is, of course, our, our specialty and what, what drives us, what, what is the most attractive thing to us about uh, playing. Um, I think that in chamber music, you have the sort of um, perfect mix between um, playing your own part as a sort of a solo line, what you have to contribute as an individual, and then also interacting with a group of other people that are also, um, uh, so you have this individual aspect and also the teamwork aspect, and you're really working for the composer uh, in order to try to um, play emotionally and um, excitedly, um, but also have a focus and um, a, a drive that, that is um, derived from the interaction of the personal energy of the people in your group. So it's really the, the, the high point for us of, um, of what music can be. So is it unusual to have a focus of a school like this just on chamber music? Well, it's not as unusual as it is. Um, what this place has to offer, though, is something very unusual about chamber music. There are a lot of places to go uh, where students study chamber music in the summers. Um, but what's so special about this place is the, the, the focus as far as the setting is concerned, because you're absolutely focused on what you're doing musically, and everything is set up to really help the students to be as focused as possible. And then the whole format of this, where a different professional string quartet comes in each week uh, to work with the students, um, in addition to having a sort of a, an, another faculty that's sort of uh, providing continuity, uh, but the students have a chance to see really how individual quartets can work together in different ways to solve problems, sometimes having diff very different approaches to solving the same problems um, that are very effective and very um, individual to that, to that specific group. Um, but the students then can really learn and say, oh, well, this is how these people solve this problem. Oh, this is how these people solve that problem. And it really is an ideas lab uh, where students will come back from Madeline Island with an amazing uh, breadth of perspective and practical ideas that then they can, they can work out and try and experiment with throughout the year. Tell me something about the faculty up here. They're, they're What's, what's extraordinary about, uh, about the people who come up here and teach? I think it's, it's really this dedication. Dedication to the students and dedication to the art of chamber music. Um, there are people who teach chamber music um, all across the country. Many of them are uh, primarily orchestral players or um, solo players. And the, the dedication of chamber music players to teaching chamber music to um, talented high school and university students that are very interested in it um, is just, I think, a really unique lab. And then just the fact that the students gain the perspectives from different professional quartets that come through. Uh, and not only just come through to play a concert and then leave, but really um, invest in each group that they're working with, invest in the students that they're working with. So um, interesting, yet you know, there's some discussion last night. There's no conductor, so how, how is it that quartets keep it together? Well, there's no conductor, but there's the map that is the score that really um, is a wonderful guide to showing how the parts are related, how everything fits together, how the composer has taken sort of one vision of a complete work that you might find as a piano sonata or something, and then made it into a puzzle. 
taken the pieces and spread them out, given them to different people to then reassemble in, in, in real time. So it's sort of like, you know your puzzle piece, you know what it is, you know how it fits, you toss it into the air, just as somebody else is tossing their puzzle piece into the air, and then you watch it just assemble itself you know, in, in real time. And I think that's, that's very exciting to the audience, and it's a wonderful um, sort of uh, chemical chemistry uh, that the audience, audiences just love chamber music for that reason. Uh, so you have four really talented musicians. Is there some kind of sublimation of the ego when they when the musicians get together in a group like this? Well, you really do feel like you're working for the composer, and the the greatest composers put their greatest music into the string quartet genre. I don't think that anyone who's an orchestral musician or or a, a, even a pianist would would argue that. That's sort of a, a that's sort of a. a universally accepted um, uh, fact about uh, what the great composers did. So, um, and, and what can composers are continuing to do today. So there's still wonderful quartets being written. Um, I think that as you are working together, as you are becoming a part of this, um, it's really sort of like any any relationship that you're in, in order for for that to function, in order for you to achieve something greater than you can have on your own, there's a certain degree of teamwork. There is a certain um, sublimation of what you are uh, going to be um, shining out at the moment, but instead that you are going to be adding your specific um, adding your specific vision of how you can support this line, of how the rhythm can flow, of how, um, how you can influence the, 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 the flow of the music. And I think it's great, for instance, that, there's a, that there are Academy Awards for lighting and for set design and for supporting actors, not only for the principal actors. And so as you are uh, even like script editing, you know, that there, there uh, that the, movie industry um, accepts all of these as being so important to the the creation of a film and so when you're in a quartet you know maybe you're not the lead maybe you're the set designer maybe you're maybe you're doing lighting at that moment but whatever you do you have to be just so um, wonderfully committed to that artistically so that the whole thing will will really come together and the audience will get to be um, taken somewhere that they couldn't have gone otherwise. Can I pause for just a second? Class, you talked about them getting the emotion, the emotional intent of the composer right. How do you, that's interesting, that's kind of an interpretation, isn't it? In a sense it is, and yet there are certain factors that we have learned to accept as part of the communication of music. And I think that the, most, the way most people can understand this is through film music that they've seen. Um, if you take some music that's, that's very uplifting and exciting, like something from an action film maybe, then it will, it will probably have a lot of driving rhythms. It will probably have a lot of, of um, uh, something jagged, something energetic, something that's, that moves suddenly. Um, it will have that kind of thing. And then if you think about a different film or a different part of that film that's, that's very um, introspective, the texture will be smooth. The, the, um, if, it's, if it's a serene moment, it will probably be in a major key. Um, something will be um, very gently flowing. And just sort of understanding that sort of um, interplay between some very basic things about music, high and low, um, if it's in a major key or a minor key, if it seems happier or sadder, if it's more turbulent or more calm. These are the same elements that, um, that um, classical composers use to communicate, uh, with, uh, to communicate their emotions through the musicians to the audience. And so um, even though there are certainly each person playing the same piece will uh, have a different response to it and, and make it sound different. Um, there are some universal 
uh, aspects of music that you can tap into to um, to develop a sort of sound world to so that you know like what the story is about. You know? so, so how precise is the notation of a composer? I know that Mahler's Fifth Symphony, the third movement, I heard a discussion on public radio about how it's played a lot more slowly and more lugubriously today than maybe was intended. So mm. how, how does a composer communicate what their real intent is about the temple, for example? Well, their, their language to do that is rather limited. They have the, the pitches, they have some general indications, then they have to really trust the musicians to invest in figuring out, okay, well, how does this piece move? How does it, how does it flow or sort of what is it about, you know? Um, how, how serene is it or how, how flowing is it? Um, uh, how, you know, how, how much contrast should there be uh, between uh, this part? Is it if, if, let's say, there's a part that is more active, how much more active is it? Is it a complete change of scene? Is it, is it more the memory of activity? You know, that's where, like, if you had different scripts um, with a, or you had the same script and different d film directors, you know, what would they emphasize? And it's, it's sort of something that you could come back to in, in that same way, the sort of analogy with film uh, and just the, the development of that, you know, it's like, well, how, how romantic is this relationship, you know, or, uh, you know, does it, is, is it, is there tension? What kind of tension is there between the characters? And that kind of thing is, is open to the interpretation of the performers. It seems to me like if you're in a, in a uh, quartet, you, you spend an awful lot of time with these people, you must get to know them pretty well. It almost seems like a marriage involving four people. I think that, you know, in, in my group, certainly we do know each other very well and we enjoy playing together and, and really um, um, blending our sounds together, really working together to try to bring out um, not only what's the same about the music, but what's different about what we each have to contribute in any moment. And we try to make that as vivid for one another as possible in order to really inspire each other to be playing in, in the moment as well as 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 well as we can, as expressively as we can, and uh, to make it a wonderful drama for the audience to experience. In this dog-eat-dog -dog world we live in, what, 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 uh, why is music important? What does it contribute? Wow. Um, well, I think music contributes many, many things to people in its abstract nature because it's invisible uh, and it's very personal. It's, it's um, very specific without being, um, without being definite, uh, that each person can have a definite reaction or a specific reaction that, that really is their own. Um, they, can be, they can be taken somewhere just through sound, just through the emotion of it. Um, uh, as a listener, I think that that's, that's just this wonderful thing that, that you can travel through time and kind of unbottle or uncork these emotions of, of these fantastically sensitive um, or visionary people, uh, fantastically energetic, alive people from centuries ago through their music is a wonderful kind of, it, impression of just the continuity of, of the human spirit that you can't get through reading history of, of just, well, and then on this date, such and such happened, and on that date, such and such happened. It's just you really can feel these emotions, and you can have a chance to kind of translate them into, uh, into today. Um, I think that for, for players, um, and f there's, there's been a lot written about um, the way music education influences the brain and, and one's development intellectually and, and physically. And I think that, that in order to have um, a sort of intellectual idea or an aesthetic idea 
uh, of, of uh, something artistic and then to have to translate that into the physics of wood and, and metal uh, and then the parameters of pitch and rhythm and then also then to translate that into your awareness of your own physiology and how, how moving affects the, this physics to create the artistic vision is a really wonderful thing that, that encourages everybody to cross a lot of boundaries mentally uh, or, and physically in their own lives uh, to um, create this wonderful effect for audiences too. Do, do you, there, there has to be a difference between listening to music and playing it. So you, when you go to a concert, do you kind of abandon concerns about the structure and everything and get carried away? Or, or uh, Tell me about that a little bit. When we go to a concert, you mean? Yeah. Well, you can, we're, we're aware of many levels of this and, and, you know, I can't say that we always have the same reaction when we sit down. I mean, we, we could be bouncing from one level to another. I mean, sometimes it's, it, it has to do with the sophistication of what a, a certain performer is doing to achieve a certain effect. And, and other times it can just be just marveling at what the composers manage to accomplish or just like, wow, they put that sound with that. That is just nobody would have done that, you know. So or sometimes it's just like, I love this piece. I don't know why. It's just fantastic, you know. It kind of thinks it reminds me a lot of it. I've done a little oil painting and it's it's painting with musical notes, the, the, the coloration of it, of it, it seems to me. Certainly. Uh, let me see what else I have here before they eat us alive here. Yeah, God, this is uh, awful. Uh, just, uh, you know, I guess the setting of, the, of this place, any, any extra th things to say about Madeline Island, why you, why you love to come here? Well, I think just the focus, the, the environment, certainly being surrounded by so much natural beauty, you do feel um, that you're away from it all. And I think that that helps the students and also helps the faculty to really um, be able to focus in on just uh, communicating everything that we can, teaching as much as we can about um, what we've managed to figure out so far about how to play um, as expressively as possible, how to, how to work with our bodies to achieve a lot of variety of, of sounds from the instruments, and uh, really to be able to have the, the quiet and the serenity to really delve into the score and say, oh, well, this, what could this mean, or what could this be about, or how could this be different? So. I guess I have one more, more question. What do, what do students get when they, when they leave here? How are they different than when they came? I think they receive a phenomenal amount of information um, from uh, professionals that are further down the road than, than they are. Um, they have more experience um, uh, solving problems, more experience even just understanding the nature of the, of the challenges that, that Beethoven presents or, or that Schubert presents. Um, uh, I think that they have a chance to spend time with um, uh, professional musicians that are uh, devoted to chamber music, that are devoted to wrestling with these same issues that, that um, students are working with. And uh, I think just having a chance to see um, up close and to interact very, um, interact very directly and uh, personally with um, performers uh, and see things up close, how things are, are working and to get to know that, get to know um, performers over the course of a few days and really to understand their insights in a way that you can't if you're just going to work with them in um, a two hour master class or going to hear their performance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Boy, these mosquitoes are going to win this yeah. battle, aren't they? I think they've already won the whole battle for the planet. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so will, will you be at lunch? I will. Okay, well, I'll see you there. All right, thanks again.
Sure. Thank you. I hope I didn't um and ah too much. No, yeah, I thought you were just fine.